Okay. We're now going to talk about, uh, we've talked about social skills training and peer generalization. We're now going to talk about implementing exposure therapy. And as we said, in exposure therapy, this is very individualized for the specific fears that the person has. So there's different ways of doing exposure therapy. Exposure therapy can be graduated or it can be intensive. And what I mean by that is graduated, we would use a hierarchy. So we would talk to children about the different things they're afraid of and we would build, I talked about, when I talk to it with children, we talk about a ladder. So we build a ladder of their fears, starting with things that make them only a little bit uncomfortable and then building up to becoming extremely uncomfortable in, this, in situations. So in some cases, um, we might start with, you know, well, I'm afraid of reading in front of people. And so we might have them start out by reading only in front of two people and then go to four people and then go to standing in front or standing outside the cafeteria um, at the University of Central Florida and just reading as people walk by. So it can do different levels of that. In an intensive exposure procedure, we wouldn't bother with those silly reading in front of one or two people and reading in front of four. The very first day, we'd just say, okay, we're going to go read in front of a whole bunch of people. And we're going to do that for a period of time. So depending on the age of the child, depending upon the fear, we may uh, do it graduated or intensive. In this particular treatment pro, uh, program, the exposure is always therapist accompanied. And that's because if it was easy, as easy as just saying, well, just go do it, people could do that. We'd all be out of jobs. They wouldn't need us if it was as simple to get over their fear as just saying, well, just go do it. So, so we do therapist accompanied exposure because we want to make sure it's being done correctly. Again, if I can use an example from someone with obsessive compulsive disorder, a young girl I worked with who was afraid of touching things because they might be contaminated. She told me that her previous therapist told her to go around and touch things. And she said, you know what I did? I touched them. I did touch them, but I touched them with just the edge of my fingernail. And then I went home and I cut off my fingernail. So I did what she told me to do. I touched it. I didn't wash, but I cut it off. So I didn't have the, um, the exposure, the, the contaminants. So that's the reason why you've got to do it with people, because they're afraid. If they weren't afraid, they wouldn't need you. So you've got to help them um, when they're in the situation. So thanks to Brian's dog. Um, who just poses so very nicely, Kiki, and who is one of our therapy dogs when we have people who are afraid of dogs. Um, but if you ask people, inherently people know this, how do you get over your fear of a dog? You've got to be around a dog, right? So how do you get over your fear of being around people? You've got to be around people. You've got to do that thing that you're afraid of in order to get over it. So. The rationale that we use is if we're afraid of something, we usually try to avoid it because that makes us feel better. By avoiding it, our fear goes away, but we never learn not to be afraid of it. We're always afraid of it. And so we don't learn how to cope with those things. So exposure teaches us how to face our fear. And I, I saw in Dr. Silverman's office, you know, a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, which is one of the things I live in my life is every day do something that scares you. Yes. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, some people who have social phobia, uh, is it, you say, we're, the goal is to get, the, to get rid of their anxiety, but mm -hmm. how realistic is that? We don't want to get, I mean, not all their anxiety, right? Because for some people it might be like, uh, right. yeah. I see what you're saying. We don't want to go too far. So we don't want kids going up to perfect strangers and starting conversations. Mm -hmm because that could be very dangerous for them, right? So they could get snatched or something bad could happen. So, so we, what we want to do is, is teach them to be comfortable in the situations where they should be being comfortable, but not get rid of, of anxiety that may in some cases actually be helpful or protective. Is that what, what you mean? Yeah, so. that and also for some people, I guess, okay, maybe I'm going off on a tangent. That's okay. They want to get rid of all their anxiety, mm -hmm. but maybe for some people they, they have to learn how to manage it. Yes. Okay. 
what, 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 my goal is always to help people get rid of their anxiety. For some people, that may never happen. Some people may always be more, I'm always going to have a little fear. So as I tell parents, my goal is, not, is for your child not to go from being the shyest kid in school to the kid who's dancing on the tabletops and drawing attention to themselves at parties, but to get them back in the middle, to get them to feel no more anxiety than what everyone else feels in those situations. So yes, the first time we go on a date, the first time we go, or maybe every time we go on a job interview, there's going to be a little bit of anxiety there. That is actually productive. If we talk about the typical U-shaped curve for anxiety, a little bit of anxiety actually helps us do our best. Too much anxiety impairs our performance. Too little anxiety probably impairs our performance as well. So a little bit of anxiety, but not the overwhelming fear. So. Um, that people have. That's what we want to eliminate. So when we're doing exposure, we think about these two steps. The first is we want to do a behavioral analysis. We want to make sure we know what it is that they're afraid of. We can't just assume that we know what it is they're afraid of. And then the second is to do exposure. So when we're talking about graduated exposure, and what I mean is we're going to have you, if you're afraid of heights, we're going to have you go to the second floor, and when you're comfortable with that, we're going to have you go to the third floor, and then the fourth floor, and then up and up and up. Um, when we're doing graduated exposure, we're talking about counter conditioning. So what we're saying is, you know, just the way fears can be conditioned, we're going to counter condition them. We're going to have them associated with something other than anxiety, an emotion that's incompatible with anxiety. So whether that's relaxation or happiness or whatever it might be. So we're talking about doing this gradually, not eliciting a lot of anxiety in that situation, just a little bit and keeping people in the situation until any anxiety they have goes down. So it's a very gradual approach, okay? The goal is exposure under minimal distress when we're doing a graduated approach. We only want to get them a little bit nervous or a little bit anxious at a time. Okay? We have to do what we call a hierarchy. So we have, we sit down with the child and the parent and have them rank order the situations that create distress for them. Okay? And sometimes you can do relaxation training or, counter con or cognitive restructuring. You don't have to. You can. Um, sometimes kids like to know they have a tool. So sometimes they'll say, well, what, do I, what am I going to do if I get really anxious? And so even though I'm explaining that they're not going to get really anxious, they're still worried if they get really anxious. So we teach them deep breathing. We teach them relaxation so that then they can feel more comfortable. Okay. We don't, if we're doing graduated in vivo exposure, we don't have to do imagery. You know, if, if the thing that scares you the most is that you'll be standing in front of a group of people and start to talk and they suddenly all start laughing at you. That's hard to recreate in real life. And in some cases we have to, with adults, have them imagine that and do the exposure almost in their head so that they can imagine themselves standing in front of a group like this and all of you are laughing or yawning or you know, giving me all kinds of signals that what I'm saying is stupid or dumb or whatever it might be. So with graduated exposure and with in real life exposure, we can do it at a much more a slower pace. We can use things in the environment and with younger children, that's really the way to go because as we talked this morning about some of the cognitive deficits that young children have um, with just thinking about things, it's often difficult for them to hold an image, imagine something for a long period of time. So we can have them do it in real life. Okay? It works pretty quickly. So, um, and children can see the relevance, the relevance of it. Whew, it's getting to be a long day. Um, so, if we think about what usually happens. So, people are in a situation, I'm afraid of snakes, somebody gives me a snake, I get really anxious, and I run away, okay? I leave the situation, my anxiety goes back down. What I've just taught myself is to run away anytime I see a snake. Right? If 
I could stay there. What would happen after a period of time is my anxiety in the presence of that snake, that dog, those other people, whatever it is, will habituate. My anxiety will come back down okay, to where it was when we started, even though that snake, that dog, those people are still there. If we do it over a period of time, okay, what we find is that the anxiety, even on initiation, gets less. Okay? Sometimes the time to habituate, the time to get back to baseline, will get shorter. This is what we call habituation, sometimes called extinction. What we're really doing in our brain, we now know, is we're learning something new. We are putting down new neural pathways in our brain. We are making connections, associations, that that thing no longer creates anxiety in me. That thing has lost its ability, and I've now learned that I'm not anxious when I'm presented with that snake, dog, whatever it might be. Okay, so behavior analysis. We want to make sure that we understand the child's social phobia. We want to make sure we understand what it is they're afraid of. Are they afraid that people are going to laugh at them? Are they afraid, no, no, it's not that they'll laugh at me, but they'll think I'm dumb. Okay? No, no, it's not that they'll think I'm dumb, but I'll do something really stupid and I'll embarrass myself. It can be different for every single child, and so we need to know what it is for that child. We can generate a list that will help us identify the core fears, and that's when I was talking about assessment earlier this morning. Some of those things on the anxiety disorders interview schedule, on the social phobia for anxiety inventory, the different situations that you see in there can help you identify the situations and what it is that the child is really afraid of. And that's what you're going to use to do these exposures. Okay? Again, getting ahead of my slides. Um, the material, you can use your clinical assessment, you can use um, structured interviews, self-monitoring scores, discuss with the parents when this usually happens, what usually occurs, what the usual response is. I'm going to skip that slide. When you're doing a situation and you're putting this child in this situation, I was showing you these curves, what you want to do in the exposure setting is you want to monitor their level of distress. And Brian and I are going to do sort of a little demonstration of an in vivo exposure session a little in a few minutes so you get the idea. But you ask them to tell you how anxious they are. Okay? So if suddenly I was presented with a snake, my anxiety might be quite high. I might give that a number. So depending on my rating scale, if my rating scale goes from zero to eight, a snake I might be a seven. I might be extremely anxious. Okay? If you presented me with a puppy, I might be a zero. Okay? So you use a scale. I recommend with younger children you not have more than five, four or five points on the scale because the kids aren't going to know what they are anyway. I mean, really, what's the difference between a seven and an eight for young kids? So, and you have to help them anchor it. We call it a subjective units of distress scale or SUDS for short. And I'm going to show you some. These are a few that we use. Okay? The one on the left is one that we use with younger children. So it's called the self-assessment mannequin, or SAM for short. And we can ask them to point at the picture that tells us how scared they are. So we will anchor this ahead of time. We'll tell the children, OK, we're going to show you these pictures of these kids. And they'll go, oh, look, at they, they have butterflies in their stomach, or their stomach feels weird, their eyes are big. And I go, great. How nervous? Which picture is like you when you're eating ice cream? And they're like, this woman's out of her mind, right? So they go, well, there. OK, all right. Then I say, OK, so what if a lion was chasing you? Okay? Sometimes they get smart and they go here, but we know, you know, they're talking about over here. So we get them to anchor and get, teach them how to use it. With older kids who think the pictures are stupid, 
with adolescents, we can use a fear thermometer. But it's the same thing. You know, people know as it gets hot, the fear thermometer goes up. So we can do completely calm and relaxed, moderately anxious, or extremely frightened. This becomes your best friend in the exposure session. You ask people as they're encountering whatever it is they're afraid of, okay, using that SUD scale, what's your number right now? Okay. And you ask them before it starts, before the session starts, what's your number? They're usually at a one or a zero. You ask them then while they're in the situation, they may go to a two or a three or a four. You keep them in that situation and don't change a darn thing, don't change anything until doing that same thing, they're back to their baseline. Okay. Now, it doesn't take forever. Okay. With children and adolescents, you may be talking about maybe an hour. Okay. But what you don't want to do is leave them go when they're at a four or a high number. Because if you do, what have you done? You just reinforce the anxiety. You've taught them to escape. Okay. You've taught them if I leave the situation, my anxiety goes away. <laughs> we want to teach them if they face their fears, they'll conquer their anxiety and their anxiety will go away and never come back. So, as I said, for younger children, a graduated in vivo, which means in real life, approach works best. You could try a modified approach. One of the things that works well with younger children, if it's something that you really can't recreate in real life. So one little girl I worked with who was afraid of throwing up. Okay? She's 10 years old. I mean, I'm not going to make her throw up because, you know, who wants to clean it up? But... Um, <laughs> What we did was we had her write throw-up stories. Okay? So she actually wrote stories about, I'm at the zoo with my mom and my little brother. I'm not feeling too good. My mom says, you'll be fine. I say, oh, no, I won't, and I throw up. All the people are looking at me. The vomit looks like, and I'm not going to go any further because we're going to be on the web, um, but have her describe what the vomit is like, where it goes, what it smells like, what it feels. All the people are looking at me. They're all saying, look at that girl who threw up. Gross. Why would a girl throw up? Okay? And so she, she writes the story because, again, we're just trying to get her in contact with it. So rather than having her sit there and try and use her little 9- or 10-year-old brain to keep imagining that, we just have her keep writing the story, reading the story. I read the story. She reads the story. And I ask her every five minutes, what's her anxiety? And at first, it's really high. And then gradually it comes down, it comes down, it comes down. Now, if you think that that doesn't happen, you're wrong. It does if you've got the right fear and you've got the right cues. Okay? So you can modify it if it's something that you just can't recreate, recreate in real life. You can modify it by having kids write about it, read about it, talk about it. It'll do the same thing. Um, with younger kids, again, they can kind of get a little silly about some aspects of it, but that's okay. It keeps them going. So one little girl um, who wrote a story about the fact that she thought she might die, and um, you know, as, as she dies, she's like, my heart's stopping. I know my heart stops. I go, to my, you know, I go to my babysitter and tell her, my heart stops, I'm dead. And I'm thinking, like, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. But that's okay. She thought it was kind of cute, and it was all right, because it kept her in touch with what it is she was afraid of, that she was going to die. Um, stickers, as I said, will work wonders. Um, and for adolescents, you might do more imaginal exposure because, again, they have more ideas that people will laugh at them, point at them, think they're dumb, think they're stupid. Um, and so you can often have teenagers imagine a situation and do the exposure imaginally in their mind as opposed to in real life. Okay? And sometimes paradoxical procedures, because we know Teens are often fighting with issues of self-control and not wanting adults to tell them what to do. So it's sometimes saying, well, you know, I really doubt that you'll be able to go and talk in front of 10 people. It's, you know, that's kind of a hard thing to do. I'm not sure you'll be able to do that. They'll do it. So sometimes just challenging them or telling them that you don't think they can do it will often motivate them to do some of these things we really need them to do. So... Um, you identify, again, this is just a quick review. You identify the list of fears. You arrange them on a hierarchy. 
I talk to kids about we're going to build a ladder. Each in vivo session is only one task. So you're not doing like four different tasks. You just do one task until they habituate, and then they go home. Okay? You may have to do each task a couple of times because, boy, it would be wonderful if exposure was a one-shot treatment. But as you saw from the other slide, you sometimes have to repeat the task until it no longer elicits distress. What I tell people when I explain this to them and start treatment is the day they come in and they say, Dr. B, this if we're going to do that reading out in front of a crowd again anymore, it doesn't bother me. I'm not afraid. And if you make me, if you tell me we're going to do that again, I'm not going outside with you. That's the day I know they're done because now they're telling me that it doesn't bother them anymore. It doesn't elicit any distress, and um, we're finished with that particular task. Okay. So these are some typical tasks that we use. Um, and again, we've done them in situations where you don't really need to gather an audience together. So we'll often take children to a place where it's crowded and just have them start reading out loud as people go by. Um, taking a test on the board, you could do the same thing, have them do it in just sort of a public area, bring a small whiteboard and have them practice where people can see. Asking adults questions, again, um, in a socially appropriate fashion, so under your guidance such as on a campus or someplace where kids can be. Excuse me, I'm taking a survey for school. Can you tell me what your favorite place is to go on vacation? You know, excuse me, I'm taking a survey for school. What's your favorite movie? What's the last movie you saw? But they're standing there with their little clipboard and their pen, and you're sort of in the background, you know, close by, um, and directing them to whom they should go and ask the questions. Having conversations with peers. If any of your peers can come in, we often take them over get a froyo or something like that and, and have them um, talk. So acting out plays, this is one we really like. Um, we've got a bunch of, of children's plays and we'll often go to a public place and just sort of act out the different parts or read the different parts in different voices so that again you're sort of drawing a little bit of attention to yourself. Um, one of the ones that I stole from my colleagues in Australia was just walking backwards in a crowded place. Draws a lot of attention when you're walking backwards. So, um, and the idea is people wonder what you're doing. So, and they're looking at you, um, not as long as you think they are, but they're, they're looking at you. And that's what you want to do is you need to put the person in the situation where other people are looking at them, might be wondering about them. Okay. Um, singing and dancing in front of others. We have some little dances that we've created to Disney tunes that all my graduate students know now. And um, we do the dances in front of other people. And the reason for that, again, is if you're taught a dance or a song and then you have to do it, there's the worry that you do it right. Um, and then there's the worry that other people are watching you dancing to Under the Sea from the Little Mermaid musical. Um, and then making telephone calls. Again, not crank calls. Okay, so, but we do have them sometimes, well, it's sort of a crank call, I guess, call a pet store and ask what the pizza toppings are. Um, but again, because if you're afraid of making a mistake, that's a mistake. You don't call a pet store and ask them what kind of pizza toppings they have. Um, so those are some of the typical exposure sessions that we do. So here I'm going to give you, it says audience participation. I'm just going to give you a couple minutes um, if you want to work on it yourself and then we can just talk about it. But let's say that this is, is your patient. She's nine years old. She refuses to speak in class and she won't read out loud. And outside of class she interacts only with her immediate family, her cousins, and one friend. So what are some tasks um, that you might give her to, to do some exposure sessions? Be like Jeopardy, we'll play a little music here in, when we do the video, so. Yes? You might start out with something like maybe approaching uh, another person that's not the people that she already interacts with. Mm -hmm. So someone who's unfamiliar. So, okay, so that might be one you would have. What would you have her do? You wouldn't have her just approach them. What would you but have her do? Kind of introduce herself or say hello or right. something. Right, she could, if simpler. it was appropriate to introduce, her, to introduce herself or just say hello, or you could ask, have her go up and say, excuse me, can you tell me what time it is? And she could do that to a number of different people. So that's a good one. That would be a way to start. 
Yes. Okay. Um, she could record herself on the cell phone and then show it to other people in her class. Mm -hmm. That she can start getting used to hearing her voice in class as well. Right. So you could have her record her voice and have other people hear her voice while she's standing there so that they're hearing her voice and maybe they're thinking that her voice sounds funny and she's worried because she doesn't know what they're thinking. So yes, you could have her do that. Okay. I was thinking for the read aloud thing, she could start by reading aloud to those people that she does interact with. Mm -hmm. Start with them and then gradually. Right, and then gradually add in other people, add in new people, withdraw those people that she knows. So good, okay, very good. Those are some good tasks, so, okay. All right, so, um, Let's have, let's pretend that Brian is Jessica. So, and, and our task for, um, is to have him read out loud, okay? Um, so, why don't you come up, Brian? We'll do a little demonstration here. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Sunil. Sunil? Okay, why don't you come up because you are his um, cousin. So, you don't have to do anything except stand there, I swear, okay? Okay. <laughs> So, and can we borrow your book again? So yes. Brian can just fake reading. So, okay. So, yeah, stand over here for a second. Okay, Brian, today we're going to start to practice something that's a little bit difficult for you. You told me that it's hard for you to read. Okay. So, um, I, let's start that part again, okay, because I forgot to ask him his baseline first. Okay. Hi, Brian. How are you today? Okay. Good. Um, remember that scale we had last week that went from zero to four about being nervous? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just sitting here talking to me right now, how nervous would you say you are? Uh, one and a half. One and a half. Okay. Good. All right. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to have to start approaching your fear. Do you remember how we talked about dogs? Mm -hmm. And what did I tell you about the dogs? They're nice. Dogs are nice, absolutely. And I said, if you're afraid of a dog, how do you get over your fear of a dog? Be by a dog. You have to be by a dog, right. And we said that, first of all, we might want to start with some non, not really scary dogs, right? And mm -hmm. then build up to scary dogs, mm -hmm. okay? So, but you told me that you're afraid to read out loud and have people listen to you mm -hmm. because you are afraid that they might think you're dumb or stupid or that you might miss a word, right? Mm -hmm. So today we're going to practice reading in front of other people, okay? And the first person you're going to read in front of me, and I brought your cousin Sunil in to read, to hear you read, okay? So I'm going to have you start reading, okay, this really cool book. <coughs> gonna listen. We're going to listen to you very carefully. The original edition of this book was edited by Patty Bryan, along with her husband, Mike Bryan. Patty reorganized much of the book along with Mike. Okay, so five minutes have gone by. Oh, so you need you to move a little bit out of the shot there. Okay, oh. <laughs> so, okay. so five minutes. So five minutes have gone by. Brian, remember that scale from zero to four? How nervous are you right now, reading in front of both of us? We're listening to you. Uh, four. Four. Okay. You're doing a great job. Just keep going. I would like to thank my editor for the first edition, Elizabeth, mm -hmm, uh, <laughs> for her support and help, and my agent, Joe Spieler, without whom this book would not exist. Okay. So five more minutes have gone by. Brian, how anxious are you right now using that sud scale from zero to four? Uh, three. Okay. I Keep would going. like to thank Sue Klein for editing help and Mary Wolf. Mary. Oh, I think you just said that wrong. You made a mistake. I would like to thank Sue Klein for editing help and Mary Wolf. Mary. Yada yada. Yeah. I would also like to thank. So, how anxious are you right now? Oh, I'm a four again because you said that I made a mistake. Okay. Well, you know, people make mistakes. So go ahead and keep reading. All right. This is a guide to adolescents, how to understand them, cope with them, and to the extent that we can, direct their turbulent lives. Okay, so another 10 minutes have gone by. What's your number right now on that SUD scale? A two. Okay, let's keep reading. You're doing a great job. Just keep going. We're listening really hard. <laughs> Teenagers of today have been raised in an era of far less harsh parenting practices. Their world may be complicated and scary. 
nonetheless, they feel more empowered than teenagers of previous Okay, generation. another 10 minutes have gone by. What's your number right now? One. Okay, let's just read just for a couple more minutes. Go ahead. Okay. They are mouthier, less directly obedient, especially at home. This change in teenage behavior is real. It requires a similar change in... Parents. Another five minutes has gone by. What's your number now? Uh, about a half. Okay, we're done for today. You did a great job. As a matter of fact, you earned a lot of stickers, and so um, we're going to go over to the prize box and find something. So good. So thank you very much. Okay, you can sit down again. So, okay. So um, what I was trying to illustrate in that was, was several things. First of all, that we use something that, you know, was supposed to only make him or her, in the case of Jessica, feel a little bit anxious, but in reality, you saw what happened, got up to a four, right? If I was going to do this and he was really afraid of making a mistake, I would have found a book or something for him to read that was really hard for him to read because I need him to face his fear. His fear is making a mistake. So I have to have him make a mistake, okay? Now he's making it, He's a good reader. He didn't miss many of the words. But he ha so we often use Jabberwocky, okay, because I dare anybody to read that poem from Alice in Wonderland without making mistakes. So uh, we'll have them, them read something that's hard for them. And we'll start out by saying, well, you know, this is kind of hard. I really couldn't find anything that was third grade level. So this is like sixth grade level, but we're going to read it. Because I want them to make mistakes. They have to make the mistake that they're afraid of in order to get over that fear. So basically, we would give him something that was hard to read, but we're doing it in a very controlled environment, right? It's just me, his nice therapist, and his cousin that he already knows pretty well. So that would be the first session. We would do exactly that the next session and the next session until he came in and when he was making mistakes, reading was brillig in the ciliary slope um, and going on and, he, and I'm like, well, how anxious are you? You just made a mistake. He goes, one, okay? So he's not anxious anymore when that happens. Then we would go to another situation. So we would maybe add in, keep his cousin, add in somebody he doesn't know. Okay, add in a couple people he doesn't know. Go outside where other people might walk by and hear him making mistakes while he's trying to read. So the idea is that it's not it's really not that he's afraid to read. Remember when we're talking about people with obsessive compulsive disorder and they say, I'm afraid of the doorknob? I mean, really, they're not really afraid of that piece of metal, right? They're not afraid of the piece of metal. They're afraid that the metal has germs on it. Those germs are going to get in their body. They're going to get sick. They're going to die. That's what they're afraid of. So with um, this particular situation, what he's afraid of, he's not afraid of the book. He's not afraid of reading. He's afraid of reading out loud and making a mistake, and then people will think he's stupid. So we have to have him read out loud and make a mistake, and people have to hear him so he can worry about whether or not they think he's stupid. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing you notice is that I never said relax, take a deep breath. Okay? I don't want to be, him to be distracted or to use another technique, in this case, to get over his fear. I want his fear to go away all by itself, by just confronting it. So I don't want to do anything to distract him. I don't want him to think happy thoughts. I don't want him to think that we didn't know he made a mistake. Okay? I want him to learn to not be afraid in that situation that he's worried about, making a mistake while he's reading. So I encourage him. I tell him, you're doing great. I can say, I know this is hard. You're doing a good job. Keep going. But I don't say, concentrate on happy thoughts. I don't say, take a deep breath and relax. You don't do that when you're doing exposure based on a habituation or extinction paradigm. Okay? The other thing is you'll notice when he first got back to baseline, when he said one, I didn't let him stop, right? Because we don't want people to learn, oh, if I just say one, I stop. So you often will vary how long people will continue, not real long at that, 
um, back at their baseline level, but you want them to have some opportunity to keep doing the task at a very low level of anxiety. And you do have to tell people, we're going to do this until it doesn't make you nervous. You also have to use your behavioral observation skills in the sense that people will sometimes say, one, one, I'm a one, and you know they're not a one because they're completely flushed, they're sweating, you know, and they're just trying to get out of it. And that's when you go, here's another sticker, you know, whatever it is, you're doing a great job, I know this is hard, we just got to go a little bit longer. So you keep them in the situation, you keep um, confronting them with what it is they're afraid of, and you keep doing it until their anxiety habituates. Once you start a task, you don't change it unless you realize you've done something wrong, you left something out. Okay? So you don't do one task one week, one task another week, one task another week, no. You pick a task that you know is going to capture their fear and you stick with it until you have habituation. If you jump around on tasks, you're never going to, um, to get rid of the fear. The idea is, again, if his fear is making a mistake, that might be making a mistake reading out loud, that might be making a mistake and singing the wrong words in the song. That might be making a mistake and calling someone by the wrong name. Okay? But if we're doing making a mistake, it shouldn't matter what the other surroundings are. He's making a mistake. So another task that we often do with children sometimes is we have them go up and say, um, excuse me, can you tell me what's your favorite kind of animal, gorilla or chocolate? Okay, well, chocolate's not an animal. Okay? They've made a mistake. Okay? Now, most adults are very nice to children, and they don't go, you idiot. You know, so they'll just say, oh, well, a gorilla, of course, or chocolate. I didn't know chocolate was a, an animal. You know, so they'll be nice. Um, we went to a philosophy department once to ask them what was their favorite color, red or blue. And the philosophy department, that person said, well, he, didn't, he needed to know what kind of blue it was. Was it cerulean blue or azure blue? Or, you know, so we just decided we wouldn't go to the philosophy department anymore because um, those, those questions were way too high for the poor little nine-year-old. So, um, so that's what we do. After the session, we discuss the results. <coughs> You know, if that task was only supposed to elicit moderate anxiety and elicit extreme anxiety, I might pare back the task a little bit um, the next time just to only get to moderate anxiety. Because as I said, again, you know, once you get to be an adult, it's easy to understand you have to get over your fear by facing it. When you're a little kid, it's still sometimes difficult to understand that rationale. So giving kids an out, giving them a, an understanding that this is going to be uh, manageable, that they're not going to fall apart. It's sometimes you might want to just tweak the session a little bit. Um, you go on and they have to have homework. Okay? So again, all of the therapy does not occur just in the, the two and a half hours in the week that you have them um, with you. You need to give them homework assignments. So his homework assignment for the week might be, I want you three times this week to read in front of your mom and dad. Okay. So again, people he knows, give him a chance to do that. I might send him home with something really hard to read, so he has to read something where he's going to again make mistakes, but he's going to practice making mistakes and practice becoming comfortable because we all make mistakes. Okay. If you go back and look at this tape, I've probably said the wrong word a number of times. Um, but that's what happens, and we just have to learn to live with it. Okay. And we have the kids sign a contract. So again, um, basic information on rewards that you might be familiar with is, is that is rewards have to be immediate. Okay? So if you do something and I don't reward you for two days later, it's highly unlikely, particularly when you're young, that you're going to get the relationship between that or you're even going to be able to wait two days to get the rewards. Have to be consistent. If every time I read out loud in front of somebody that scares me, I'm supposed to get chocolate ice cream, I have to get chocolate ice cream. And it doesn't matter if I was a holy terror 10 minutes before that. If I did my reading, I get chocolate ice cream. You have to find a different way to punish me. Okay? Um, as I said, it's one-to-one. -one. Behavior equals reward. If I do the behavior, I get the reward. Most of these contracts fall apart because parents aren't able to supply the reward at the time when it needs to be supplied. Okay? It should never be available otherwise. So 
if I get chocolate ice cream when I'm reading in front of people, I shouldn't be able to get chocolate ice cream at any other time, right? Because then why will I read? I can get chocolate ice cream tomorrow and I don't have to read. So you have to set up a situation where it's one to one, okay? Where I do this, I get this. It's a behavioral contract, okay? And you never, as I said, withhold it. If the goal is we had one little guy who worked, we worked so hard, he was going to have kids come over and stay at his house that weekend. He misbehaved. His parents said, that's it. The kids aren't coming. Oh, okay. Just ruined everything that we had done because he'd worked really hard to have his friends come over. And then all of a sudden he wasn't allowed to have his friends come over because he did something else bad. Okay. And you may need to do some shaping, obviously, as we were sort of doing here, starting out with just reading in front of one person and then going up more and more. Okay. All right. So we try and use daily reinforcers and weekly reinforcers. So a daily reinforcer is something that you get every time you do your homework. And it could be exemption from a regular chore, deciding what you want to wear to school within reason if you're an adolescent, um, a special snack, 15, times, 15 minutes alone, doesn't have to be money. As you can see, most parents resist giving their kids money for doing these things, but it doesn't have to be money. The weekly reinforcers are if I've done my homework every single time I'm supposed to do it. So if I'm supposed to do my homework four times a week, I only get my weekly reinforcer if I've done my homework four times a week. Okay? So I get a small one every time I do it, and then I get a bigger one because I've done it a number of days. And again, it could be selecting a video. I get to say what we eat for dinner Saturday night. Um, I get to say what we're going to do this weekend as a family, or maybe new supplies for a hobby, staying up extra late on the weekend, um, any of those things. And again, the reinforcers you know, have to be something that you really want. If you don't like chocolate, okay, biggest block of chocolate in the world isn't going to change your behavior because you don't like it. Okay? Um, you like vanilla, so it has to be vanilla ice cream, not chocolate ice cream. So it has to be something that you like and it's going to be different for every single kid. We often hear um, parents who, or kids who say, well, I get everything I want. You know, well, probably not. Um, it just means that you have to work harder to figure out what it is that they'll work for. Right. Okay. We have, um, this is from um, the SETC, the SETC manual. Um, we have little contracts that are in there, but there's nothing magical about this. It's just to show you an easy way to set up um, a contract. Um, daily rewards, potential daily rewards, potential weekly rewards. Okay. Um, and we tell people to put the contract where everybody sees it on the refrigerator. Okay. It's where all the important papers go. So put it on the refrigerator. Everybody can see the contract. Everybody can be held to the contract. We have parents and children sign the contract so uh, for what it is that they, they need to do. All right. So here are some sample homework assignments that we give children to do in between sessions. So they may have to call classmates on the telephone. We say, well, call your classmate and ask what the math homework is. And they go, well, I know what the math homework is. Well, just pretend you don't know what the math homework is and call or call and ask for your spelling homework, something like that. Invite someone over to your house to play. Um, and then have a friend or two sleep over. Sleepovers are really good because it takes, it's a long period of time that they're in contact with other kids. So unlike coming over to play at your house for an hour, a sleepover, you got to interact with these kids for a number of hours. So that's a good one to use as a homework assignment. Ordering food in restaurants. Okay? Asking store clerks questions. So I said before, I have $20, excuse me, ma'am, I have $20 to buy my mom a birthday present. Or, excuse me, ma'am, can you tell me where the vitamins are? You know, can you tell me where the shoe department is? Again, appropriate questioning of adult strangers in environments where it's safe and it makes sense to do that. Okay? Um, asking and making, answering and making telephone calls will often give the kids assignments that they have to call us every day. Tell us what they did in school just to get them to use the phone. Okay? Or we'll tell them, we'll call them, and they have to answer the phone. Okay? Joining groups or sports teams as they get more comfortable, going out and, and participating in, in those types of activities. So what would you give Jessica or Brian 
for homework assignments. I gave you one, but what were some other ones that you would give a nine-year-old? Go ahead, Jim. So maybe eventually reading out loud in the classroom in front of the teacher, but when the other students aren't there. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. What else? Another one that we use a lot of for kids who are afraid of doing something embarrassing, I just thought of this, other than walking backwards, is we have them drop something really noisy in a really noisy place. So the jar of, of coins um, from, or the tokens from Chuck E. Cheese, and we find some tile place or um, something where it makes a lot of noise and we have them just drop them so that everybody sees it and hears it. Just do it repeatedly. Okay. So, or walk with a cup and spill water where people will see it. So anything that provokes that people are going to think I'm you know, stupid or I made a mistake. So, and sometimes you have to do them with it. You, have, you can't have social phobia either because sometimes you have to start. You have to do it with the child to get it started. So I've walked backwards more times than I care to count. Uh, so in order to get the child to walk backwards. And sometimes the child has to walk, start walking sideways. So you're walking backwards, the kid's walking sideways, and, you know, and then finally you can get and shape them and get them to walk backwards with you. So um, often the, those types of things can help get them moving. Okay. Um, 